Okay, so today we are moving forward from the chromatin to the next stage in the gene expression. So, how that can be regulated? So, we will move to the next step. Okay, next step in gene expression is the nuclear RNA processing. So, this obviously is eukaryote specific, right. So, we are in a developmental biology class. So, we are constantly talking multicellular environment, all right. So, therefore, uh, splicing, nuclear RNA processing, or other processing, all of them become important. So, let us look at that. Um, so, if you look at the A here, so in both the cell types, so here are these are two different cell types. In both cell types, you have five different messenger RNAs being transcribed, okay, five different genes are being transcribed into RNA. And if you look at the cytoplasm, you have C D E coming into the cytoplasm in cell type A, but you have A B C coming out to the cytoplasm in cell type 2. So, this is uh, nuclear selection in what is getting exported and what is not getting exported. So, even at that level you could have differences. So, there are certain developmental contexts where regulations at these steps become important okay, in the overall context of the embryonic development. So, you cannot always do it at the level of methylating histone or uh, DNA and controlling transcription at that level. So, there may not be enough time for it. And second, uh, these transcripts may be used later in some other stage. Okay. So, therefore, they are made in advance. So, the, that, that is why these um, so, um, regulations at the post transcription step make sense depending on the context, you know time and spatial context and one of them is this kind of nuclear selection. And the second uh, uh, regulation at the nuclear level on RNA is the splicing. Okay. So, if you look at here, so the central bar diagram tells you the actual gene structure uh, as you see it in the nascent RNA, okay, just to transcribed, not spliced. So, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 different exons here and these vertical lines, you know these V shaped ones indicate which is going to be joined. Okay. So, like for example, this indicates that this exon and this exon is going to be joined and this will not be joined. So, the number 2 will be treated as an uh, intron in that case. So, this place donor where I am pointing is connected to this splice acceptor here. Okay. So, skipping two other potential ones in the middle. So, that is one way of splicing. So, you, you are bringing together exons 1, 3, 5 and in another one you find 1, 2, 4, 5. So, this is alternative splicing. Okay. So, alternative splicing is not a minor component in gene expression regulation. So, as you will see in subsequent slides now. So, that is where we are going to spend bulk of uh, today's time. So, this is um, you know okay, an a, as a real example for the first thing that is nuclear selection. Okay. So, this is sea urchin embryo at, at an early stage you are looking at this is a phase contrast showing all the cells here. So, here this is an in situ hybridization uh, revealing the localization of a certain uh, messenger RNA which is here this C Y 3 or uh, A. So, that is expressed only in a few ectodermal cells not all over the embryo and that is further uh, illustrated in this northern blot where RNA isolated from ectoderm in lane 1 and RNA isolated from endoderm and mesoderm in lane 2 are run separated okay, electrophoretically and transferred to membrane and probed with radio labeled probe for C Y 3 A intron specific probe that reveals in this okay, that is revealed by this um, you know larger um, RNA. And if you look at it the difference is not much they are more or less similar level of um, level of presence indicating that in both the germ lab uh, or all the three layers 
it is being transcribed, it is definitely there in ectoderm and as well as in endoderm and mesoderm. But if you look at uh, the same transcript using an exon specific probe which is going to hybridize to the in a lo large uh, fraction of the RNA there will be mature mRNA present in the cytoplasm okay, because the processing happens quickly and they come to the cytoplasm. So, therefore, it is largely hybridizing to the cytoplasmic mature RNA and there what you are finding is its level is very high in ectoderm compared to the other two indicating that there has been a selection in terms of the um, RNA in the cytoplasm okay, what is getting exported. So, in ectoderm it gets preferentially exported, but not so in the other two germ layers. So, now we will continue with this splicing. So, splicing you can have any one of four different ways of alternate splicing. So, one is in uh, example A type 2 pro, pro collagen where you are seeing cassette exon, exon. So, you have 1, 2, 3 as a cassette and then 1, 2 as another one in two different types of cells. Here you have precursor chondrocytes and here you have the mature chondrocytes. Okay. And another type would be mutually exclusive or in one tissue type you have one exon, but not the other and in the other tissue type you have the other exon and the other one is not present. So, here if red is present purple is excluded and if purple is present red is exclusive they both are mutually exclusive. Okay. So, that is one variety and the third is alternative splicing by splice site variation okay, 5 prime splice site here the donor site. If you look at um, this um, you know exon 2 you will see that these lines um, particularly you look at the line between exon 2 and 3. In one you have uh, you know the full exon 2 is included because the splice donor starts after that. In the other one somewhere at the beginning of this exon itself you have a splice donor and as a result bulk of exon 2 is excluded when that splice site is used. Okay, so, you, you pay attention to these two V shaped uh, lines that tells you the beginning of a intron. So, here it begins here as a result exon is small. So, here it begins at the end of it and therefore, here the exon is full. So, in this case this has serious consequences this BCL XL is actually uh, inhibitory to programmed cell death okay, it inhibits cell death and this small one actually induces cell death okay, it is totally opposite con consequences. And in most cancer cell lines this XL version is common. So, as a result apoptosis is inhibited, so cell goes uh, you know it continues to proliferate. Okay. So, therefore, these have serious con functional consequences so that, that is what I want to point out here. And the other one same thing, but with the 3 prime splicing. Okay. So, if you pay attention to this first V the top and bottom you will realize you know they end at different places. So, these are the four mechanisms by which alternative splicing can happen. Does this happen to only a small number of genes or large number of genes? It actually happens to almost all genes, more than 90 percent of the human genome genes, protein coding genes are subject to alternative splicing. To give you an idea, the number of genes in C. elegans and human are not very different. Okay. Uh, but if you look at the organism's complexity, either anatomical or functional, you know, a Homo sapien can learn all of this and come and teach a class, but C. elegans cannot do that. Okay, uh, it is a very simple anatomy, having only couple of tubes, but then having all the basic biological process. It has a nervous system; it can sense pain and so on. So, the bulk of the complexity 
between C. elegans and Homo sapiens come from alternative splicing. Okay. So, therefore, this is a major thing. So, do not uh, take it as an aberration in the gene expression. You will see some examples, you know, uh, really um, you know, amazing examples. This is one of them, but this is nothing compared to what you are going to see the next one. So, this is tropomyosin, alpha tropomyosin in rat. So, in different muscle cells um, here up to this, these are muscles, you see different um, you know exons included. So, here these colored ones, these green ones are exons present in all the different variants. Okay. And another important thing is sometimes alternate displacing can affect the 3 prime UTR sequence. You know, these have this 3 prime UTR sequence while these have this and this one has little bit of this and then this. So, the importance of 3 prime UTR will become clearer when we go to translation regulation, okay, maybe 3, 4 slides from now. And here you have some smooth muscle specific uh, exon included in this and you have striated muscle specific exons, the uh, yellow color ones included only in them. So, by these various permutation combinations of excluding and including exons, you can generate a variety of proteins. So, therefore, the definition of one gene one enzyme that became one gene one polypeptide now actually becomes one gene and one family of proteins. So, we are saying family because they do have some similarity, right? some exon sequence is there in all of them. So, that is what it turns out now. And uh, the most complex alternative splicing that we know currently is this uh, drosophila neuronal mRNA. Okay. This is um, expressed in neurons and we will see the functional importance in the next slide, but this illustrates okay, from one single gene you get 38,016 different mRNAs that is nearly double that of the entire uh, protein coding genes in Drosophila. Drosophila has only about 14,000 genes. Okay. So, it is nearly double of uh, C. elegans genome itself. So, here you have 24 different exons in this protein of which the colored ones if you look at them, any one of these uh, stripes segments can be selected as exon 4. Okay, 12 different alternatives are possible to serve as exon 4, 12 different adjacent sequences. Similarly, exon 6, 48 alternatives are possible and then exon 9, 33, exon 17, 2. Now, if you work out all the combinations, it works out to be 38,016 and experimental data supports that vast majority of them are all actually produced. So, now, look, let, let us look at why that is important, you know how that helps. So, this is more like the VDJ recombination in um, you know human B cells are uh, doing a similar purpose here, but for uh, self recognition. So, here is a neuron. Okay. So, here you have branched dendrites and these dendrites need to know they are coming from the same cell body. Okay, so, they are essentially sisters and there is no point in they connecting to each other, they are not going to get any new information. They need to connect to adjacent neuron or another neuron in that chain, then only it will be useful for nerve impulse conduction. Okay. So, this self repulsion is provided by that unique disc alternative spliced version produced in that neuron and another neuron has different alternative splicing therefore, its own pin code okay, in terms of discam exon composition and that is what helps this avoidance shown in B and connections uh, sorry here avoidance is not shown. So, this is one connection this is another question green and purple and here green and red. Suppose let us say you know I mutate this discam is not produced. So, what would you expect? These will not know to ripple and they will all get adhered and they will make a mass of a connected neuronal structure and that is what happens. 
okay. So, this is wild type highly branched here joint okay. So, all experimental data. <laughs> so, so, this is real life we are dealing with life and biology. Um, uh, the two things we understand here one is there is whole lot of new mechanisms out there about which we have no clue at all and we need to discover them we have to go and discover them and sec alternate displacing is one of them and we are going to see next example uh, where uh, you will find only couple of decades ago we recognize the existence of that phenomenon. Um, there is no way to predict uh, that it is out there you need to go there and see it and you need to see the functional consequence in a mutant like this you know shown in D here neuron lacking discum okay. So, this is alternative splicing and uh, another example this is an interesting example because this work happened uh, exactly around the time I joined the department as a postdoc and this paper had come out from another lab in the same building and uh, it was it was in the press and it was talked about and um, I was excited to read and that is there in the textbook. So, we will read about this. So, here you have a muscle specific uh, splicing issue. So, you have mutations now ok. Now, we are going to look at disease conditions. So, in Drosophila we saw we mutate and find the function. So, in human patients uh, is there a consequence when these splicings do not happen as they are supposed to be happening. So, we will see a, an example here one example here what we are seeing is uh, a muscle specific uh, situation. So, here if you look at the A the top um, horizontal bar in the intron between exon 1 and 2 you have a premature stop codon I should not say premature stop codon there is a stop codon. Uh, if you translate from exon 1 in the same reading frame into this intron ok that will happen if this splicing failed and this intron sequence is included and that happens when you have a mutation in the intron ok and due to that a G in the intron ok it is not affecting any amino acid sequence and the G becomes a A and due to that that promotes uh, splicing starting from that point ok around that area. So, therefore, a part of this intron is included and due to that you get termination and you do not make a functional protein ok. So, in this case that uh, stop codon would never be encountered because the whole thing is excluded and as a result you straight go to exon 2 and that the reading frame continues and here you make this protein. So, this name of this protein is myostatin. So, this one prevents muscle cell proliferation at appropriate time and they differentiate into muscles right away. So, you do not make too much of muscle you make less muscle ok normal required amount. So, in a family where they found this four guys were already athletes and a small kid I forgot the age, but it is a you know elementary school child or even less than that was able to hold a 3 kg dumbbell in both hands with both hands fully extended ok, because its muscle was so strong at that age. And we can do it in model organisms and this is here this is the mighty mice mighty mouse ok. This normal mouse this is the mighty mouse. So, that is why it attracted press the paper came in nature and then this faculty was on press uh, you know uh, meet with uh, TV radio and newspapers. So, um, so, you see the muscle difference right between the two because the cell proliferation was not stopped at the right time. So, they made lot more cells and when they differentiated they made lot of muscles. So, will a developmental biologist right away recommend to a physician that you mutate and make more muscles? No. Will not because developmental biologists will think what will be the other consequences right. For, for example, uh, 
you know you will worry about methylation patterns uh, when you think of uh, only the coding sequence. So, similarly you will expect there will be other complexities, you will think there will be a phylogenic and ontogenic reason for why that cell division stops at that. So, you will not immediately mess up. So, but this gives you an idea of what happens when you have splicing affected. All right, I think that to convey the message about the importance of splicing. So, next we will move on to translation regulation. So, translation regulation is very key in certain contexts. Okay, two examples are really outstanding examples to illustrate this point. One is um, early embryogenesis and another one is the adult nervous system. Okay. Um, you take a neuron for example, it has a cell body and has a long exon and at the end of the exon you have synapses and you have to at the synapses uh, at the synapse what do you have? You have to produce neurotransmitters and secrete and then the post synaptic neuron must have the receptor to accept it. And if these things have to be produced and degraded very quickly and very rapidly to sync with the nerve impulse conduction, you cannot go ahead and uh, unwind the DNA by modifying you know the chromatin and then transcribe and then get permission from the nucleus to come out you know and before that of splicing all that. You will not have time for it and after that the protein has to be transported to the end of the in, uh, axon to get to the site of synapses. So, that problem is usually solved by making the RNA and keeping it stored where you want and when the correct signal comes you translate okay, that is one context. The other context is you think of the cleavage in the embryo right or uh, it is rapid and quickly happens and during all that time you are not going to be able to do the new transcription to take care of the embryo embryonic development particularly coordinating the cell cycle and producing lot of cell membrane right. You, you are making lot of new cells so cell membrane and in each one of them cytoskeletal elements you need to make all of that and lot of chromatin you need to make you know you are increasing the uh, number of uh, you know copies of genome right from just to two copies in the first nucleus. Now, you are going to make lot of nuclei and you need that much of chromosome you need to make all of them and then the cell division cycle need to be regulated and then once you finish cleavage and in some organisms even during that time cell fate specification happens like for example, in C elegans at the first division itself the fate of the two daughter cells are different. So, fate specification also need to happen. So, all of that you cannot do by controlling trans transcription. So, there again translation regulation of mRNA produced by the mother and deposited in the oocyte plays a critical role. So, much so that in some organisms you can get rid of the um, nuclear components, but still the cell cycle can actually happen without the uh, you know the nuclear material because cytoplasm has the required things to simulate that. And these are contexts where translation becomes important. So, now let us see how the translation regulation happens. Okay. Um, so, one uh, mechanism by which translation regulation can happen is increasing or decreasing the stability of the messenger RNA meaning once transcribed how long will that messenger RNA survive before getting degraded. Okay. So, you can have a half life for that the duration taken for the messenger half of the messenger RNA to be degraded. Okay. So, if you take uh, in a lactating mother the prolactin mRNA normally produced in the mammary gland gets quickly degraded okay percentage of in so this experiment I should explain the method first. So, this is mammary gland cells uh, I guess mouse mammary gland cells cultured and uh, you incubate the cells with radioactive um, you know nucleotide like in this case uh, probably UTP 
So, the all the RNA synthesized gets uh, radioactively labeled. Then wash the cells of that medium containing a radioactive nucleotide and put in fresh medium without radioactive nucleotide, but you have unlabeled one. So, that is called the chase period. Now, you watch the labeled RNA how long it stays. Okay. So, without this hormone, you know the lactation stimulating hormone prolactin, it gets rapidly degraded. Half life is you know uh, probably about 2 hours or 1 and a half hours, but with the hormone it stays you know for more than 2 days. So, this is uh, by increasing the stability then the mRNA is available for multiple rounds of translation. So, you increase the protein product. So, the ultimate goal of differential gene expression is to vary the uh, the kind and uh, um, amount of proteins from one cell type to another cell type. So, that is the ultimate um, end point of gene expression when you talk about protein coding genes. So, this is stability an example for st uh, differential stability. So, here the stability is under two different conditions. The next one that we see is what normally happens in oocytes. This was first uh, described in good detail in Xenopus oocytes. So, therefore, we are going to look at that example and this is the kind of regulation that is uh, critical in almost all the oocyte development that people study. Okay. So, in, in fact, in our lab it is exclusively we study translation regulation of the germline. So, let us look at this. So, here um, okay, before that I should introduce you this idea of looking at the mRNA. So, normally you write our mRNA as a long line 5 prime uh, cap to 3 prime polyatyl, but in reality in cells they do not exist uh, exist like that they instead are found in ring like form. Okay. So, the 5 prime end and 3 prime end are brought together by proteins that by find to the uh, 5 prime cap like for example, translation initiation factors that bind there to the 5 prime cap or in 5 prime UTR etcetera. They interact with proteins that bind to the 3 prime UTR or 3 uh, poly A tail and those protein interactions make them into a circular structure. Okay. So, that is what you are seeing in this electron micrograph and here is one example. So, normally the initiation factors binding to the 5 prime cap they interact with a protein that binds to the poly A tail okay, called poly A binding protein and that is how this circularization happens and that is required for uh, binding of other initiation factor like 4 G which recruits the small ribosomal subunit and initiate translation. Okay, so, that is what normally happens. But in uh, Xenopus oocyte, the most mRNA that are not translated at a given time, they are um, found in circular form, but not by the interaction of 4E, 4G with the PABP. Instead, a protein called the maskin binds to 4E uh, in preference to binding uh, 4G to 4E. And that mass can interact with a protein called cytoplasmic polyadenylation element binding protein, okay, CPEB, that binds to this uh, polyadenylation signal sequence and that interacts with mass kin which interacts with 4E. And this kind of circular form totally excludes the other initiation factors and therefore it is translationally dormant, it does not get translated. And when you have appropriate signaling, for example, progesterone hormone, which stimulates uh, oocyte maturation and uh, can complete the meiotic division upon fertilization, and that leads to an activation of a kinase that phosphorylates the CPEB. Okay, and when the CPEB is phosphorylated, it recruits a protein called, you know, cleavage and polyadenylation specific factor and that recruits a poly A polymerase that is gold 2 okay, uh, for those who know C L against lingo. So, it recruits that poly A polymerase which extends the poly A tail in the cytoplasm. 
Remember when we learnt about eukaryotic gene structure, I said some polyadenylation happens in the nucleus and in some of the developmentally regulated ones, additional polyadenylation happens in the cytoplasm. So, this is an example of that. So, you have further extension of the poly A tail and this poly A tail now binds the PABP okay. and that can now interact with 4 G and uh, this phosphorylation also throws the mask in out of interaction with the 4 E, it gets displaced, now translation starts. So, sequentially the mRNA that has not yet been totally worked out how this is choreographed, this gives you a mechanism of how activation happens, but then there is a wave of uh, you know sequential activation, some mRNA are expressed at certain stage, some mRNA are expressed later and so on. So, that is still being intensely studied. So, this whole mechanism was worked out at the beginning of 2000, you know like the papers were coming out in 2001, 2002 around that time. So, now this mechanism has been found in many other organisms uh, where you can do lot of genetics. So, there they, are, they have done whole lot more work on many examples of this kind. Okay. So, let us look at one such example. So, that is the Drosophila oocyte. So, where you have a protein called a bicoid. So, this bicoid is actually an interesting protein, it is a transcription regulator as well as a translation regulator. Here we are seeing it is a translation of you know version of it. So, it binds to a sequence called bicoid recognition uh, element on an mRNA that encodes a protein called caudal. So, this caudal is required for posterior development uh, or rather to prevent the posterior development in the anterior. Okay. So, this needs to be suppressed and that is done by bicoid which promotes normally anterior development. Um, and when it binds to this, it uh, you know recruits this another new protein which binds to the uh, methyl cap and this excludes all the initiation factors. So, this is how it prevents the translation of uh, caudal mRNA. Okay. So, now you realize that the general theme here is proteins that interact with uh, RNA sequence can interfere with uh, translational uh, activation okay. and some of them actually increase or decrease the poly A tail in some contexts not in Xenopus oocyte context where even with shorter poly A tail the mRNA are stable, it is just that they cannot bind PABP and therefore, they are not translated, okay. but they are not degraded. In certain cases if you remove poly A tail, the RNA is marked for degradation. So, here there are some examples of the molecules, you know mRNA molecules that are regulated and where they function and in what organisms they come from. Uh, these are listed here, the list continues, okay. cyclane not surprising right, cell cycle regulation. So, it goes on, okay. so from multiple organisms, so this is obviously an evolutionarily well conserved mechanism. All right, next one kind of obvious, but then it took a long time for people to find an example of this. Um, if proteins can bind sequence specifically to 3 prime UTR and 5 prime UTR, why not another nucleic acid right? Co sequence complementarity should give you lot more specificity to the se given sequence. And this was found in an interesting uh, screen in C. elegans embryogenesis. So, in, in C. elegans embryogenesis you have um, a certain pattern of division that can actually end up reiterating if certain gene expression changes do not happen. Okay. Let us say at fourth cell division level, a certain pattern of asymmetry is generated during cell division and you do not want that to be reiterated again because you will end up producing similar kind of cell fates in another generation as well and that is avoided by blocking some gene expression. So, mutations in them are called heterochronic because in the time order they are at the wrong time. Okay. So, what should have been at the third stage will end up repeating at the fourth stage or fifth stage or even later and therefore, they are called heterochronic mutations. 
and one lab uh, that identified a mutation that had a heterochronic phenotype when they finally mapped they did not find any proper protein coding sequence there. And when they you know they were very certain because the phenotype is clearly there and their mapping they were very confident about the locus they mapped and they knew that that locus matters even if it is not encoding protein. Then they carefully looked at and then they found it encodes short RNA a small RNA sequence that is complementary to the 3 prime mutator of another RNA that is involved in this lineage specification. So, LIN stands for lineage ok in C elegans most genes have 3 alphabets and a hyphen and a number the number usually is the order in which that particular gene belonging to that class was identified. So, LIN meaning lineage defective in that it is the 14th uh, gene that they identified. So, if you look at LIN 14 mRNA sequence in the 3 prime mutator there are you know the colored sections ok 1 to 7 and those are the sequences to which this LIN uh, 4 ok that is one of the heterochronic mutant mutation which was not encoding a protein and they found it is a small RNA and that is complementary in this fashion. The loops indicate where there is no complementary ok where you see linear thing there there is base matching ok. So, this uh, was the first discovery and is this something nematode specific and you are not going to see that is not true. Now, uh, in the last 20 years people have discovered these small RNA are naturally encoded in the genome just like the C elegans genome and they regulate the translation of vast majority of mRNAs. The current estimate is about 30 to 40 percent of all human mRNA are subject to regulation by these small mRNAs called miRNAs ok, um, micro uh, interfering RNA molecules or micro RNAs shortly. And this is how they are made they usually exist in multiple tandem repeat copies and they are transcribed and once transcribed you have a nuclease a drosha that cleaves. So, these the information in this cartoon comes from studies in multiple organisms ok. The, the first example is from C elegans that is where it was first discovered, but then people worked out the mechanism by studying multiple organisms. Um, for example, Drosha was discovered in, um, in Drosophila where they made extracts cell extracts and did these reactions in vitro. So, these multiple repeats are digested into individual units in the nucleus by Drosha and that is transported into cytoplasm and see these come as hairpin repeats ok and that hairpin is removed by a cytoplasmic nucleus called dicer and now you get the two strands and they are unwound and loaded on a complex called risk ok. This co risk complex is the one that takes the one of the two strands of the miRNA duplex and uses that to identify the target sequence and goes there and binds to that and binding to this can have multiple consequences. One of them is the RNA gets cleaved ok, the stability is reduced dramatically. This is one, but you can have multiple consequences um, that is there in this then we will go back to that example. So, this MIRNP ribonucleoprotein complex carrying that um, sequence MIRNA sequence can do any of these three like for example, it could inhibit initiation complex you know a protein binding to the 5 prime cap or it can inhibit ribosomes ability to elongate it can interfere with that process or it can remove the poly A tail and uh, reduce the stability of the RNA or it could actually recruit proteases to digest the nascent peptide that is coming out. All three mechanisms have been seen with specific examples ok um, and does that uh, you know to what extent it matters like in a mammalian context. So, here you have the uh, lymphos, uh, you know lymphocytes context where development of the different kinds of lymphocytes and if you see if you have a lymphoid precursor cell which is usually low in this um, miRNA usually called MIR and some number. So, MIR 181 
Um, so, you get both B cells and T cells and B cells express MIR 181 in larger abundance than the precursor. Okay. But if you artificially introduce large quantity of MIR uh, uh, in a MIR 181 in this precursor cell, it will end up producing uh, you know uh, among the daughter cells vast majority will be the B cell type and not the T cells. So, you make more B cells at the expense of T cells. So, these have clear de uh, developmental consequences in multiple organisms. Okay. Well, that is what the fate is you know in the mirror whatever it is going to prevent expression uh, preferentially leads to B cell formation and T cell differentiation does not happen. So, each cell type is going to have one specific set of uh, you know gene product not genetic information gene product and as a result its fate is going to be different.